There are functions for which analytic integration fails. For these kind of functions, we use numerical, computational methods. And you've already been introduced with one on the rectangle method. We're also gonna use trapezoid rule and Simpson's rule to numerically integrate functions. So let's kind of look into, let's look into numerical integration. Numerical integration is used to find the area of a region when analytic methods are not possible or are very difficult. Not all functions can be integrated analytically. We don't have rules for everything. So this is where we use numerical integration. However, the results are inexact, but they get better if we increase the number of sub intervals and we use better methods of approximating what the sub interval actually looks like. So the general process for any form of numerical integration is to divide the region into smaller subintervals and use some sort of defined shape for the subinterval and keep that consistent. And then we find the area of each one of those pieces and add them together to obtain the approximate area of the entire region. And we want to make it as exact as possible. It's never going to be perfect without analytic integration, but we can get very, very close. The three me major methods we're going to talk about are the rectangle methods, trapezoidal method, and Simpson's rule method. Now, rectangle methods, we've already discussed. In fact, that was kind of our lead-in into definite integration. We talked about Riemann sums. We talked about how to add rectangles together. So we're going to focus more on the trapezoidal method and Simpson's rule method. However, just a quick review, rectangle methods use rectangular shapes to carve that area up. Using a horizontal align to approximate the top of the subinterval part. It is really the least effective method because there are usually large gaps because a horizontal line is not really a good way to approximate a function that's changing. The three main types of rectangle methods we've used, the first two, the left and right point rules and the midpoint rule also uh, to divide it up into rectangles and then look at them. And just to briefly look at an example where the rectangle method was used, here's a function that we've divided into four subintervals, each of which is a rectangle. And you can see using these horizontal lines for the top of the function is really not a very good way to approximate how the function's changing. Nevertheless, it's an approximation. If we made carved it into a lot more subintervals, we could get a better approximation. Uh, you could also use the right hand endpoints. That would overestimate. You could use the midpoint rule, that would be a little bit better. For a smaller number of rectangles, this is not going to work very well for most functions. So there are better ways, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Let's look at the trapezoid method, also known as the trapezoid rule. It is gonna use a trapezoidal shape to divide the area up into subintervals. The subintervals will also be trapezoids. So instead of approximating function with a horizontal line like a rectangle, this is gonna approximate the function with a slope line and over a reasonably small interval that's going to work out pretty well because a slope line is a pretty good way to approximate functions we saw that in linearization over small delta x's math quote of the day from admiral akbar so here's that same function f of x equals one half x squared plus one and we've divided this into, instead of four rectangles, four trapezoids. Now, just looking at this, you can see that these sloped lines that are the top of the four trapezoids do a much better job than a horizontal line would. The gaps are much smaller. Even with just four trapezoids, we have a much smaller error in the area than we would under the rectangle method. So we gotta go back to a little bit of geometry to get the area of an individual trapezoid. And if you remember, for a trapezoid, it's one half of the base, which is the width of the trapezoid, times the heights added together because it's kind of like the average of the two heights. Well, in this case, the base is delta x. It's b minus a over n. It's the width of the single trapezoid. We have two heights. For each trapezoid, there is a left-hand height, which is f of x of the left-hand point. For the first trapezoid, that would be f of x zero. For, say, the fourth trapezoid, that would be f of x three. The second height in each trapezoid is the right-hand point's f of x. So for the very first trapezoid, it would be f of x one. For the last trapezoid, it would be f of x four. 
So when we put that together, the area of the first trapezoid here would be one half b minus a over n, one half of delta x, the width, times the two heights added together, f of x zero plus f of x one. We could do the same thing for the other three trapezoids. Notice each one of them, the left-hand point is the, is the first number, the f of x left, and the right-hand point is the f of x right. An interesting thing ha happens if we try to add them all together. What winds up is that the first f of x, the very first one, f of x zero, and the last one, f of x four, are only added once. But all the other ones, because they're in actually two trapezoids, they're the end of one and the beginning of the other, they wind up getting added twice. So in the case of our four trapezoid situation, we would have one f of x zero and two each of f of x one, f of x two, and f of x three. And this can be generalized of any number of subinterval trapezoids, b minus a over 2n, notice I just put the 1 half in there, so it's 1 half times b minus a over n, that's our width part, times the very first f of x, f of x zero, plus the very last f of x, f of x n, the very last f of x, and then all the middle f of x's, 1, 2, 3, 25, all the way to n minus 1, are multiplied twice. And that is the general rule for finding the area under a region using trapezoids, also known as the trapezoid rule. Let's look at an example using trapezoidal subintervals. And we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and find the area under the curve of f of x equals x to the third minus two x squared plus x plus three between an a of equal a left-hand endpoint of zero and a right-hand endpoint of two, with only four trapezoids. You know, we can certainly actually use analytic rules to find the exact area, but that'll actually be useful in comparing the two results. And you can see here already, using trapezoids to approximate these subintervals is far better already than using horizontal lines in rectangle methods because the gaps here are much smaller. So if we take our formula for the trapezoid rule, if you will, which is one half times the delta x times all the other parts of which we use the left-hand point and the right-hand point only once and all the middle points twice, and we plug those values in, we get the area is equal to b minus a, two minus zero, over two, the one half part, times four, the number of trapezoids, times the first f of x, and the last f of x, which would be f of a and f of b, only used once, that's the three and the five, and then we use all the middle points twice. This would be f of 0 0.5, f of one, and f of 1.5. Each of those is multiplied by two because they are contained within two trapezoids. When we compute that, we get an area of 6.75 units squared. Now that's not an exact area because there is a little bit of error, but it's a pretty good approximation. And if we try to analyti analytically integrate this, we would find an area of 6.6 .6 repeating. So we're only off by about 0.1, a little bit less than 0.1 square units, which is pretty darn good considering we only had four trapezoids. So that's how we use the trapezoid rule, obviously using more trapezoids, which isn't really that hard to do. Using more trapezoids is gonna give you a much better answer much more quickly than rectangle methods. In this screencast, we discussed numeric integration generally as a process, and we looked specifically at the trapezoid method for numerical integration. Next, we're going to look at Simpson's rule using polynomials to integrate.